um, that Brian's had a 30 plus year career in various nursing leadership, academic and consulting roles, which focus on system redesign, culture change and patient flow. In 2018, he was voted one of the 20 most influential people in the 70 year history of the UK's National Health Service and was, an was awarded an OBE for the services to nursing and emergency care in 2019. It's just amazing. Well done, Brian. Uh, Brian, together with uh, Professor Linda Holt, uh, they um, developed the global social movement called NPJ Paralysis, uh, of which I, I know that Brian's going to talk a little bit uh, today about that. His CV is very, very long, but I'll leave it at that and I'll stop talking and I'll hand over to you, Brian. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much indeed, Sue, for that very kind obituary, which could be summed up as I was born when I was very young and I'm not dead yet. So thank you. And thank you all all of you for, for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, and and soon I've been talking since about the 1930s to, to make this thing happen. So brilliant to be here and thank you all for, for coming. And, and what we're going to talk about for the next 10 or 15 hours, we're just going to, have to see how it all goes is the uh, what I think of. In fact, I think there's been three pandemics. Two of them have been traveling along all the time. And then obviously, as we know, COVID has, has been the um, other one. But the two, the, the three uh, are obviously COVID. Uh, the other pandemic, which I'll talk about largely, is deconditioning, which is 10 to 100 times more prevalent than uh, falls of pressure sores. And the third one actually is of loneliness. So, but I'm not, for time reason, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on that other than refer to it, but also I'm going to show a, a short uh, film on that, on that theme. And also, as well as the deconditioning and loneliness, I'm going to uh, show towards the end, a short film about a new campaign that is led by a Kiwi Aussie doctor called Dr Mike McCabe out of the UK, which we've done a soft launch for. And you'll sh we'll show you a short film on that because that's very exciting as well. How do how do the small things make the big differences? But first, let us do, dwell on and focus on what deconditioning is. And if you look at the Oxford Dictionary, it's, uh, you know, that, that would define it as losing fitness, muscle tone to a lack of exercise. Farlex and partner talked about the loss of physical fitness um, to maintain an optimal level of physical activity or training or inactivity for any reasoning may lead to deconditioning. Incidentally, as a by the by, I'm going to send Sue the PDF of this whole talk. So if you're happy to, and if Sue maybe put that in the chat box, uh, Sue's email address and get in touch with her, it'll be done by WeTransfer. So it's a big, big file. Um, obviously, because it's a side presentation, but um, it, it'll be a link that you can download so you can access. If you can't access the mm -hmm. link at work, send it to your personal email. You can download it there because it'll be a big file, but really, really happy. And I'll send other materials as well. Really happy to share with you. And my, philosoph my philosophy is knowledge hoarded is always knowledge wasted. So the more we share stuff, the more we give stuff to each other, the more we support each other, the more we all get and um, help each other. But also most importantly, or as importantly, is we support our patients as well by, by sharing it with those around us. Dr. Amit Aurora, both wonderful friend and leader of the Get Up, Get Us, Get Moving campaign, and, and we are very closely together. He and I uh, did a chapter on this in our definition of deconditioning is that it comprises the physical, psychological, which is important, and functional decline occurring as a consequence of prolonged bed rest, related to muscle loss, loss of muscle strength, and most often experienced through hospitalization. But if you think about patients, they spend up to 95% of their time in bed or the chair. And in fact, breaking down those percentages further, it's around 83% of the time in bed and 12% of the time in the chair. And the rest of the small tiny bout is about um, walking around or mobilizing. As an aside, you know this thing about the 10,000 steps, it's actually a marketing myth from a Japanese firm in the 1980s. Clever because it took off, it took off the world. But for people who are middle aged to maintain um, um, notional uh, fitness, reasonable level of fitness, middle aged post is about seven steps a day. 
for um, older people to have 4,000 steps a day. The average person in a hospital setting does 400 or less. But physical inactivity itself is a killer. If you look at some of the data from England, 37,000 premature deaths a year. And Public Health England, which was for the first time, did a study which also talked specifically about deconditioning, showed 110,000 additional falls. And that's about a 3.5% increase, which at scale obviously is 100, over 100,000 falls related to deconditioning because we've had the world's biggest social experiment in that we ask people to go into their own homes and stay there for protracted periods and we were really really successful in terrorizing the bejesus out of them because what they did is some of them just didn't really want to come back out again and we run the NPJ paralysis if you go to ndpjparalysis.org you can see the talks which are all free to access over the last three years and one of them last year with a group of Irish physios and I say now while I'm it's in my head um, I'm doing and today it'll be bookended because I'm doing a talk at 7 30 p.m or 2 30 a.m your time um, for Agile I'm the honorary president of Agile which is a network for physiotherapists working with older people and I'm really, really proud. I'm proud to be a nurse, love being a nurse, but it was a real honour to be the first nurse to do that, this with them. But what the one of the community physios from Ireland was talking about when she spoke at our event was that people are they're not going to GAA, which is the like, Gaelic Athletic Association, and not going to the to the football any longer. Like you know, your equivalent there's Aussie rules and uh, and Irish rules, and you know there's, there's a blend of of both. So not going to the Irish equivalent of Aussie rules, not going to mass, not going out and about, and this is one of the unintended consequences of. Um, the lockdowns, the people felt vulnerable, are, often are vulnerable, but their perception has meant that their lives have got them smaller. But if you look at the bottom left, two thirds of older people experience decline in function and end up pr prematurely ending up in a care home as a consequence of deconditioning. And deconditioning is the difference between going home and going to a home in far too many cases. But we've known about this. We have known about this since before the birth of the NHS in 1948, where Dr. Richard Asher wrote a paper called, in fact, it was the, one of the 20 most influential papers of the 20th century in the British Medical Journal. And while he didn't talk about deconditioning, he went through every single body system and clearly identified the uh, consequences, physiological and psychological, of of deconditioning and the harm associated with it. So we've known this for 75 years now, but actually we've known it before then as well. If you look at Dr. Ramil Reese's work from JAMA in 1899, and what he did in his case is a sample size of about 400 patients on the day two of post-operatively, they all were got out of bed. They no one came to any subsequent harm on idiopathic harm, but equally many of them went home earlier. And that was back in the 19th century, uh, 1944, John Powers work in the state about, you know, rest as a therapeutic measure is fraught with hazard. So we have known this stuff for quite literally 120, what, 323 years and more. And it would be wrong for me as a nurse not to mention God, good old Florence Nightingale, God bless her. She was only a couple of sets ahead of me in nursing school. But she wrote, you know, she, she really got patient time and the value of patient time. You know, she, she wrote, it's now a well-known rule that to keep no patient in hospital a day longer than is absolutely necessary. And even this may be days too long because the patient may have to recover not only from the illness or injury, but from hospital itself. So we have known this stuff for a very, very long time. And this is the, the book chapter, which is free and accessible because of Elsevier made that their free chapter. So when I send out stuff to Sue, you'll happy, we'll happily share this one with you as well. So let's drill down a little bit deeper into the impact of, of bed rest on older people. 
For instance, a muscle strength of loss of one to one and a half percent per day of an activity, up to 20 percent in the very first week. And these are largely in the lower limb anti-gravity muscles that are most affected. So your hips, thighs, you know, quads. Um, muscle mass loss of one and a half kilos in a week. And one kilo is from the hips, the glutes, the, mag the quads, and those are the ones that enable us to, to stand up. So massive muscle loss, in, 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 and sarcopenia is defined as muscle loss. Bone demineralization, the loss of total body calcium, it leaches out the bones due to blood rest and, and the lack of load bearing exercises. This incidentally is why astronauts have to spend hours a day doing um, and, uh, load resisting exercises in space, but the longitudinal studies now show that they never recover in full their, um, their loss of, of mineral demineralization and, and other consequences of life in space. So although I'd be quite happy for Elon Musk to go to Mars and stay there and leave Twitter, leave Twitter alone, it will have consequences. We're a long way from that space yet, that place yet even. But this again is a real issue in terms of demineralization. And by the way, while I'm thinking about it, one in 25 patients, and it's about it's about that percentage in Australia as well as in the UK and Ireland. Um, and New Zealand's got a slightly higher rate, I think it's about 7%, it's an outlier that way. But one in 25 patients who suffer a fractured neck of femur are inpatients in hospital at the time they sustain their fall, not, not out in the community settings, but they break their hip in hospital. And I can't help but wonder, um, and I'm sure this is some of the work that Sue and Falls Prevention Fogo everywhere are doing, is many of those falls occur about day six, day seven and those, the, the falls leading to significant harm. And I can't help but wondering, they've been in bed, they've lost muscle, they've demineralized bones, and by the time they hit the ground, they, oh, by the way, they also drop blood volume by by 5%, so they get dizzy, stand up, get dizzy, fall over, and they've probably taken the head off the acetabulum before they've hit the ground in some, in some of the extreme cases. Look at VO2 max, uh, that reduces by, um, by 0.9% a day, which is the body's ability to use oxygen for cellular function. I had a, the equivalent of a drive-by shooting from COVID back in April. I only fell sick the day before I tested positive, then I had to wait my 10 days for my freedom swab. But even in that kind of 10 days of, of personalized lockdown, um, I could feel, in fact, my watch was telling me my VO2 had dropped away. So that fitness level drops off. M pulmonary function parameters leading to thicker secretions, cough gets less efficient. The risk of pneumonia increases because of, um, of mucus settling in the lower lobes. And you think about it, the, the ribs, when we're sitting up, when we're standing, we're using the whole, the whole of our, our, our rib cage. But when we're lying on our back, only half of it is being used, which means it becomes less efficient. Our breathing is more shallow. Blood glucose, they, by day three of inactivity, our insulin binding sites start to become less effective. And it takes a fort, and you know, any of us who, who wear um, an Apple Watch, I'm sure they do, they, uh, uh, other brands are available. Uh, they, it, it reminds you, if I'm sitting for more now, uh, than an hour, it tells me to get up and go for a little walk. Even two minutes of standing and walking reduces um, the insulin resistance. So it's it's one of those things that we need to, they talk about smoking being the new, uh, sorry, uh, sitting being the new smoking. What else goes on? Well, we have constipation as a consequence of reduced peristalsis because the gut isn't as, mo as mobile, because we're not moving around naturally. Um, there's a reduced fluid intake as people aren't as thirsty. If feces becomes impacted, it doesn't have the gravity feed into the, the, the descending colon to take feces towards the rectum. So people end up with constipation. UTI as a consequence of increased diuresis. And remember the mineral excretion is due to calcium leaching, which leads to kidney foam, stone formation. The bladder doesn't empty fully because again, they so <laughs> sorry I'm being tackled by my watch, it found something on the web for me. The um the uh the bladder, because people are lying back, it doesn't empty the bladder fully, which means you've got a reservoir for bacterial infection. 
So all of these things add up to a sorry, sad state. And, and of course, the one we know most about, although thankfully rarer nowadays, is pressure sores. Let's look at, at the consequences of the psychological conditioning, the lethargy, the loss of get up and go, the loss of independence and loneliness. An interesting policy debate going on in the UK right now, which in Scotland's already gone there, which is about single use rooms. In one of my many lives, I work as Director of Service Improvement in Canterbury Health System. And as many of you will know from the consequence of the earthquakes, we had to do a lot of building. I think we lost so 12 out of 15,000 rooms in the health system were demolished. And I think I had to demolish about 30, 40 buildings. You know, they're just, just natural disaster stuff. Well, we spent a long time rethinking what a future health, what a, if you like, it's the brief clinical design brief was a 21st century Nightingale ward. And it's been designed in a way where you can have single room, it turns into a double room, into a, right up to a quad room. Because one of the key things we found for patients is they become quite lonely. And if you think about older patients, you know, when you're crook, you don't want to talk to anyone. When you are get started to get better, actually you want to have social uh, exchanges with people. And the argument about single rooms and uh, infection control, to, mon to be honest, is a little bit mythological. And the reason is, is what is the single biggest driver of infection control is washing your hands, which means it's a behavioural issue rather than just an environmental issue. So loneliness is a thing in hospital. And when people in the community, loneliness is very, very prevalent. In fact, the wonderful work of Julia Holt and Onstad et al. in 2015 showed that loneliness increases mortality, early mortality by 26%. Now, she's identified that loneliness is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day and will more likely lead to earlier death than diabetes or obesity. And what I want to show you is a short film, notably about a person who goes home from hospital. And this is the story of Frankie. I think I missed you again. I'm back home from hospital now. I'm doing all right. They said to take it easy for a few weeks, but I'll be okay. How's things with you? I'll hopefully speak to you soon. Hello, message. You know, the best bit of the week now is the food delivery. We've got a really nice young chap that comes, he, he brings it right inside. <laughs> I've started leaving the radio on. It's quiet here without your mum. <laughs> the hearing's not what it was, but it, it, it's nice hearing other voices, I suppose. I didn't get out of bed today. I didn't see much point. I know you've got a lot on, but I wish I didn't keep missing you. Then he slipped on the way down. No idea what's wrong with those stairs. Do let me know if you can make it over sometime soon. I could do with a ham and a couple of things. No rush, though. I know you're busy. Loneliness is a, is a real thing for so many people, so many older people especially, but also it's really prevalent in younger people now and with more with the atomization of society and more and more people living on their own. 
it is something of consequence with consequence in in society at large and you know particularly in Australia when you look at the vast distances concerned um and and the fact that WA you know through Mark McGowan's leadership had um did a fantastic job with managing COVID but it's not without consequence so it's not all these things and and it is a feature of the, 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 the of the pandemic where people are not connecting with others and not going out. Their lives have become so much smaller. By way of, of full disclosure, my son, who actually appeared in the cameo in that, he wrote and directed this and, and Firewood Pictures, his company, we've commissioned him to do this beautiful work, as we will you'll see with some of the others we're going to show you. So when you think about, if you like, an illustration, another way of illustrating this, um, you know, the, the fact that a week in hospital can lead to 20% of quads power, loss of aerobic capacity, bone loss, deconditioning, or malnutrition, uh, disability, and so on is profound. And if you think about frail older adults, their functional reserve, it goes down an incline. But if you go into a hospital, it can actually fall off a cliff because being in the hospital and being sick has real iatrogenic consequences. So if hospitalized patients are 61 times more likely to develop a disability in activities of daily living than those who are not hospitalized, 61 times, 17% of older people, what's that about one in six, are older medical patients who walked in independently a fortnight prior to admission needed help walking on discharge and saw this with Linda Holt's father. He walked into hospital and never walked out again. Um, and not on his own, at least. And deconditioning, a Singaporean study found, it contributed to delay discharge in 47% of older people. And I think a better question than asking is the is you know is 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 the patient safe for admission may actually be a better question than is the patient safe for discharge. Because we blithely admit patients, <clears throat> excuse me, we blithely admit patients, but really, are, should we not be asking, are they safe for admission? And what's really, really important to, to stress, this is not about bad pet staff, this is not about bad clinicians. This is about us often killing patients with kindness, with good intent, not with malice. It is the unintended consequences of keeping people what we think of as safe. Now, Linda and I, and I just need to, I'm, I've written half of this book, and I've, um, I came up with a framework recently with, with um, activities of daily living, uh, dangers of the evidence of, of consequence of deconditioning, and then actions people could do. So it'll only be about 10,000 words. Um, I've got three or four books I'm doing, other books that I'm doing at the moment, but I promise this is on its way. But it will and it may not be called that in the end, but we are definitely working on this because it's, we need to get this into people's hands. If you look about the sarcopenia, loss of muscle bulk, you look at that 31 year old on the left, 66 year old sedentary person on the right and the 73 year old, and the white stuff is adipose tissue or less politely fat. But people think, well, that's just aging. That's how it goes. You look at this 40 year old triathlete and a 74 year old uh, sedentary person, but look at the 70 year old triathlete. He's got even greater muscle mass than the 40 year old triathlete. So it really is far more to do a, a, a resistance than load bearing. And I know um, in Aussie, you know, uh, bungalows for, for heat reasons and a whole bunch of other reasons are, are much more prevalent and popular. But the worst thing we can do with older people is say, oh, we'll move mum and dad into a bungalow because we're worried about them falling down the stairs. It's because they're going up and down the stairs three or four times to the loo, means that that's why they maintain their muscle mass. You see, patients don't stop in be moving because they deconditioned. They deconditioned because they have stopped moving and a shout out by the way at health physio is chris tucker a wonderful uh, uh now deputy director of allied health in northeast london and again another quote of his which i I'd love which is we often think of falls as a problem of mobility but actually it's far more to do with immobility and it's something we should reflect on i'm going to circle back to the language of false prevention and how do we rethink the framing of that? Because we have persuaded people that the dangerous of falling is so great, they'll just say, oh, I'll just lie in the fall because I do this is our new false prevention strategy. It's also about the value of our time. 
and the importance and the preciousness of our time. And although best known for NPJ paralysis, I'm perhaps even proudest for, even prouder of a new a campaign create, created out of my head. One, one day talking to a group of older people's docs, nurses and, and therapists, and it's called The Last Thousand Days. And if you will, have a look at this. He's almost over. The sky's about to show. First glimpse of gold. Waking up dreams. Thing is, I don't know why things that I felt so concerned with just let go. Drift with the green was built. So all of these things, there still ain't enough. Like the fool that they play, that the questions just hang on me. It's time with your love. I've been running around looking for answers. All of these days, there still ain't enough. There ain't enough. I'm If you look at the narrative arc of that short film, you'll see it starts with a child and works the way through. But most of that time is almost about, about one scene. It's about people living their lives. And there's people who are going to get up today in Perth, They'll have got up in Alice, they'll have got up in Darwin, they'll have got up in all places in between, and they won't see this evening. And a question for everybody really is this. If, that, that it's about patience time, and that patience time being the most important currency. Because while our time is important, our patience time is sacred. Recognising that 48% of older people will die within a year of a hospital admission. A third of medical patients are in their last year of life. And the question is this, if you had a thousand days left to live, how 